Hey everyone, my name is Preston Snee and I'm a faculty member at the University of Illinois Chicago Department of Chemistry. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about what my research group does, which is that we study semiconductor nanoparticles. These are also known as quantum dots, and you can see these right here. These materials display the quantum size effect, which means that their properties are tunable by size. What that allows us to do is to make small, let's see, or cadmium selenide nanoparticles that emit green, but if we synthesize them to be a little bit larger, then as you can see here, they emit red. Now that may make you think that these blues are the smallest quantum dot, but that's not the case. They're actually the largest. They're just made of a different material. They're made of cadmium sulfide. So as you can see that we can tune properties by size, shape, composition, and really we have all kinds of different ways of tuning the electronic structure and the resulting products have all kinds of uses and applications. Uh, actually, the QLED TV sold at Best Buy, those are made from quantum dots. They also are sought after for low-cost solar cells. And the reason that that is the case is because they have this other great property that they're very easy to synthesize. We can make them by wet colloidal benchtop method. We can just make them in a fume hood as opposed to some giant vacuum deposition device that I'm sure Intel uses to make their CPU chips. We do all kinds of spectroscopy to characterize these materials. We also, as you see here, use our, uh, the UIC Supercomputer Center to do electronic structure calculations. What's nice about that is you get a sense for the size. These materials are about as large as small proteins. And while these computer uh, studies give us all kinds of very microscopic details, I can actually give you just a really simple model for how the quantum size effect works, which is that as semiconductors, they have electrons, and as the, electron, as the particles become smaller, uh, the, you know, the electrons have kinetic energy, but as the particle becomes smaller, the kinetic energy of the electrons uh, increases as they move faster and faster, and this is a, a quantum phenomenon. And because the electron is moving faster, it has higher kinetic energy, which is why the smaller particles emit to the blue and larger particles emit to the red. So that's a quantum size effect. Now my, my group spends a lot of time synthesizing these materials and we like to address some of the systemic problems in the field which has to do with reproducibility. Reproducibility is unfortunately kind of difficult because you have to make these materials in very high molecular weight solvents. Because the solvents are very high molecular weight, they tend to have very low purities. That, that, those two properties come hand in hand. Because of the high impurities here, 10% impurities, and that's kind of one of the better chemicals, it's very difficult to transfer technology between labs and into industry, and that's done a lot of harm to advancing science of this field. Okay, so my group, what we spend a lot of time on is learning how to take something like oleic acid and we learn to purify it. Here you see us, we're, uh, we're recrystallizing oleic acid, and this does a lot to assure reproducibility. We can find these methods in the literature, sometimes we develop them ourselves, and some groups publish reports on this. I usually don't. Here's what I do. Once I figure out how to purify some chemicals that are used in quantum dot synthesis, I make a YouTube video. I even make videos of more complicated things. Here we're making a phosphonic acid surfactant. And what all these uh, chemistry allows us to do, all these fine reagents, is we can make very hard materials like this infrared emitting indium silver sulfide and we can also make these more complicated heterostructures. This is called a type 2 quantum dot. So you can see we can make all colors of the rainbow, including near infrared, which are great for bioimaging. Speaking of bioimaging, we work with experts in the field like Ann George in the College of Dentistry at UIC. She has helped us take our quantum dots and get them inside of live cells, which you see here. We're also working with Ying Hu, who's a faculty member in the Department of Chemistry. He has a microscope that can see single quantum dots, and with that microscope, we can, we can uh, examine the structure of cells, which you can see is quite complicated. We're not satisfied just with imaging structure. We can also image metabolites. Here, what we do is we have this trick of conjugating the quantum dot to a chromophore that senses something important to the cell, like oxygen. Now, with this couple chromophore, what we can do, is, uh, do here, this is done with Larry Miller's group in the chemistry department, we can image the chromophore separately and then make a map of the ratio of the emissions, which you see here, which is reporting the oxygen levels. That's important because if a cell has low oxygen levels, it might be cancerous. That's also true of hydrogen sulfide. Uh, we can actually do this trick with lots of important cellular metabolites. 
Now we're also developing more sophisticated chromophores. Here's a recent result with Ha Yang's group at Princeton University. Uh, this, is, this is certainly a very complicated type of material. It's called a giant quantum dot. And because of the unusual internal structure, it, you see it has a nice red emission. But due to the unusual electronic structure, which we've characterized in some calculations you see here, they have an extraordinarily long lifetime, 10 times longer than ever seen with a similar quantum dot. And what that means is that we can do really sophisticated biological imaging experiments, including uh, background subtraction, which means that we can make uh, background for the images, which is really great for bioimaging. My group also does fundamental studies on semiconductor photophysics with dope materials. And before we do that, we like to make the best materials. And what we've done is we've adopted a method that was created by a company in England called Minogo called the cluster seed method. And what they did was to make, let's say, cadmium selenide quantum dots, they took these cadmium selenide clusters that you see here, put them in the, the, the flask with additional precursors, and then they just heat up the solution. Now, what happens is, is that those clusters are nucleation catalysts. The quantum dot forms around them. And that means you get as many, cluster, as many clusters as you add, that's how many quantum dots come out of the solution. So that's a, that's a really neat method. And again, it was developed by a company. And what you see here is how this works. The clusters, again, are where the quantum dots form. What my group thought was, what if we had a cluster that contained dopant ions? And if the quantum dot still nucleates about it, that means that all of our quantum dots have dopants and they have the same number of dopants, which is something that people thought was impossible. So here you see a copper four cluster that we synthesized. And uh, the data shows that if you regress the number of clusters added to a batch and the number of quantum dots formed, you get a nice straight line. And you see that for two different material systems here, cadmium sulfide and cadmium sulfide. We take these materials to Argonne National Lab to do fundamental studies of electronic structure. We can do a pump probe spectroscopy where we visible pump X-ray probe. And what that means is that we can study the electronic density of the dopants in the ground and excited state. So that's really something. Uh, and so what we do specifically is a lot of, a lot of dopants are phosphors. You can see that here. As for what is happening with the electronic structure that makes them phosphorescent isn't sometimes clear, but what you see here is data, uh, X-ray absorption data of the dopant that allows us to determine the exact electronic structure mechanism that's responsible for the phosphorescence you see here. We're moving on to more sophisticated materials. Here you see a manganese telluride, which we suspect may be a ferromagnet in the ground state. Uh, and that, that would really be something. Uh, that's, that's a very preliminary study, but these are the kinds of works we're doing. And uh, I have to show one other thing that was recently reported. This, uh, as I've been talking so much about using theory, we have a theoretical prediction of a type of nanomaterial that we don't know if we can actually make it. We've tried and not succeeded so far, but, but we hope to keep trying. This is called an open shell singlet. What it is, it's a indium phosphide nanomaterial that the computer told us if we coat it with salt, the electrons rush to the surface. They, they move away from each other and they rush to the surface. Normally you would think that would happen in the excited state, but the computer is telling us it actually happens in the ground state. And that's called an open shell singlet ground state. So we are doing more investigations to see whether this material is actually real or just some fuzzy electronic noise. So uh, this is what my group does. If you have more questions, please contact us or visit our group website. All our papers are linked up here, including videos, and we hope to hear from you soon.